Okay, thank you very much, Noel. She makes me think the first Noel, dressed like that. So good to see you this morning. And uh, I'm going to read you some scriptures from Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, I'm going to read from the first chapter, uh, verses 26, down to uh, not quite the end. Verse 26. This comes, of course, in the narrative about God creating the universe and comes to where he makes human beings. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man. In his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then down to verse 31, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. I don't know if any of you are familiar with a TV program called The Repair Shop. It appears on Makeful Television, which is probably the, not the busiest channel and on Discovery Channel and basically it's about a workshop where broken and damaged family heirlooms or things of great value, sentimental or monetary value uh, are brought to be repaired and brought back to their original condition and so there are furniture restorers and metal workers and ceramicists and upholsterers and all manner of skilled people in this workshop. An old grandfather clock might be brought as a hand missing, the internals are not working, or maybe a childhood stuffed teddy bear that's missing an eye and an ear and the stuffings all come out, or an old violin with a broken neck, or whatever it might be. And uh, the idea of this program is they take it and they work on it, they bring it back until it's almost exactly as it was when it was first made. If you understand this principle of the repair shop, you'll understand the gospel. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is designed to restore humanity to its original purpose. Jesus Christ is the repair shop to make human beings functional as they were originally intended to be. And therefore, the best possible place to understand what the gospel is all about is to go back to Genesis chapter 1. And here we have the mission statement of the human race and therefore the mission statement of the gospel. The gospel is not plan B after the mess up of plan A. It is the restoration of plan A because of the brokenness of plan A. It's not salvaging humanity. It is saving, restoring humanity. Salvaging and repairing are two different things. To salvage something is to make use of it and perhaps a very different use. So you have an old car and it's not working anymore and the the, the, the tires are flat now and the engine hasn't run for years. You can salvage it, stick in your backyard and keep some chickens in it. But that's not repairing it. Now the purpose of the gospel is not to salvage messed up people. It is to repair and restore and bring them back to what they're intended to be. And I want to talk about this for two reasons this morning. Number one, there may be some of us who've never been to the repair shop. We've never come to Jesus Christ and asked him to do the work that it takes in us to make us what human beings originally intended to be. That's the first reason. And I trust at the end of this service, you will have an opportunity in becoming reconciled to God. And the second reason is many of us who are Christians have forgotten the main point of being a Christian. We get taken up with all kinds of legitimate peripheral things, but not the central heart of it. 
And so I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about the creative purpose, first of all, and then about the redemptive purpose, which is the work of Christ through the gospel in redeeming and bringing us back to what was originally intended. Now, the creative purpose has two aspects. Let me read you from verse 26, where it says, Then God said, Let us make man... And the word used for man there is a generic term. It encompasses all humanity. It's not male, it's generic. So God said, let us make, you might say, humanity, humankind, in our image, in our likeness. It's reiterated in verse 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. Notice four times he says, in our image, in our likeness, third time in our image, fourth time in our image. In other words, God said, let us, this is the plurality of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us make a creature, a creation, a creature that looks like us. In our image, in our likeness, when you look at that creature, you'll be reminded of God. Now, in what sense are human beings made in God's image? God's image. People discussed this and debated it, of course. Well, I think we can work it out by deduction. There are certain things that are true of God which clearly are not true of human beings because God has what we may call his non-transferable Attributes, attributes that are true of God, which is not transferred to his creation. So, for instance, God is all-powerful. The word is omnipotent. We're not. God is all-knowing. The word is omniscient. We're not. I've met one or two people who think they're close, <laughs> but we're not. God is omnipresent. That means he's in all places at all times. We're not. We're localized right now into the little place where we are here this morning. God is immutable. He does not change. We do for good and sometimes for not so good. <laughs> I'm getting old, so I know about that. God has an eternal nature, which means he had no beginning and he will have no end. We, we're not that. We had a beginning so there are the non-transferable attributes of God, things which he did not intend to be seen in human beings, but then there are his transferable attributes, things that he transfers to human beings, and these are to do with his moral character. For instance, God is love, and human beings were intended to be loving. God is just. Human beings were intended to be just. God is kind. Human beings were intended to be kind. God is merciful. Human beings were intended to be merciful. Adam and Eve were created in the Garden of Eden to be a visible expression of the moral character of God. So if you and I were a fly on the wall in the Garden of Eden, unless flies came after the fall, which they probably did... And we were to watch the way Adam treated Eve, we would have seen he was very kind to her. Because God is kind. If we saw the way Eve treated Adam, she would have been loving towards him because God is love. They would have been generous to one another. You saw the way they handled the animals in the garden, the way they looked after the cattle and sheared the sheep patted the dog and stroked the cat and fed the guinea pigs and cleaned out the goldfish, we would have seen what God was like. Because the beat in his image means you look at the image and you see the original. The word, the biblical word that describes 
all this is the word righteousness. It is the moral character of God intended to be exhibited in human beings, not by human beings imitating God or trying their best to be like God, but by the Spirit of God himself living within human beings and exhibiting himself in their lives. It is a derived image of God made possible by dependence on God living in humanity. And by a derived image, I mean, you're not responsible for producing it. It's derived. It's received. It's from his presence within us. I brought a glove with me this morning, and you will recognize that this glove was made in the image and likeness of a hand. It has four fingers. It has a thumb. It has a palm. It has a wrist. And you recognize it straight away. You say, that is a glove. And this glove is designed to function only in relationship to a hand. That's what it's made for. Now, of course, this glove in itself is incapable of functioning on its own. If I put the glove down on this table here and said, glove, I want you to pick up that glass of water... What is going to happen? If I say, glove, you need to try harder. Just get yourself over on your side, wrap your fingers around it, keep the thumb this side, and put a grip on it and pick it up. Of course, it's totally incapable. But if I put my hand into the glove, which is what it was designed for, and then decide to pick up the glass, I can get hold of it and pick it up, and all the power of the hand has been transferred to the glove. And so the glove's ability to behave in the way a glove was designed to behave is only if it is inhabited by a hand. (laughs) While it's up here, I'll drink something. (laughs) Human beings were created to be a visible expression of what God is like in his moral character by the fact his spirit lived within them. That was the intention. That was the first creative purpose. Let me give you the second creative purpose. And we'll come back to the first in a few minutes. Let me read again the second part of verse 26. I'll read in the ESV this time. It says, And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And he repeats in verse 28, Be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the ground. Key word there is the word dominion. Have dominion over the fish of the sea. This too was not innate within human capacity and ability, but derived from that relationship with God where God's rule over them was to operate. So they were to express his image by dependence on God and to exercise dominion by obedience to God. These were the two aspects of the relationship dependent on God, obedient to God, that produced produced the two creative purposes, that they express his image and exercise dominion. Divine image leads to divine authority, was the intention. But then after two blissful chapters, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, where God's repeated verdict is, God saw that it was good, good, repeated seven times, and then God saw all he'd made, it was very good. So that's very good. It's as good as God can make good, good. (laughs) Two blissful chapters where it was good, 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 good. In Genesis chapter 3, 
Things got broken. You remember God placed them in the Garden of Eden and said, do what you like in this garden. It has everything you need. It's beautiful, all the resources you need. But there's one thing. You see, the dominion that you are to exercise is not independently of God. It is in dependence and obedience. There's one tree in the garden. Over there in the corner, it's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do not eat of that tree. For the day you eat of that tree, that day you will die is what God said to them. And you will know that they ate of the tree. And what happened? Did they die? It says God came in the cool of the day into the garden. Did he find two corpses lying at the foot of the tree? No, they lived for many years. So in what sense... Did God mean the day you eat of that tree, the day you act in disobedience, that day you will die? He didn't mean physical death. He meant spiritual death. In the language of Paul, in Ephesians 4 and verse 18, they became separated from the life of God. Speaking in its context, specifically about Gentiles, but it's the generic condition of all humanity by nature ever since. Because it requires the presence of God in a human being to be what we're designed to be. Now that we are separate from the life of God, we no longer have the ability to be what we were designed to be. And so Cain and they, so sorry, Adam and Eve's firstborn son, whom they called Cain grew up to be the murderer of his younger brother, Abel. And everything began to go wrong. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 21, in Adam all die. That is, in the spiritual death of Adam, we inherit physical but not spiritual life. We're born in his condition. So this glove might function with the hand and pick up the glass, but you separate the glove from the life of the hand, and the hand is no longer capable of acting like a glove. And all of humanity plummeted into disaster. Because by chapter 6, with human beings no longer dependent on him and no longer obedient to him, by chapter 6 and verse 5, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, so that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he'd made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. When God saw this great tragedy of wickedness and evil, because his relationship with human beings was a love relationship, his heart was filled with pain. It hurt him. Genesis 6 and verse 7 says, or verse 6 says. When Romans, when Paul in the book of Romans is summarizing what the gospel is, he talks about this condition And as far as the image of God is concerned, in verse 10 to 12 of Romans 3, Paul says, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Notice the all-inclusiveness of that. He repeats several times, no one, no one, no one, all, not even one, together, no one, not even one, etc., That's as far as his image is concerned. As far as that divine authority also intended, verse 15 of Romans 3, he says their feet are swift to shed blood. 
Ruin and misery mark their ways and the way of peace they do not know. They are no longer expressing the character of God, the image of God, and they're no longer exercising the authority of God in dominion. And the whole thing has become a disaster. Let me ask you to exercise your imagination for a moment. Just supposing that there was a galaxy somewhere in our universe on which there was a planet similar to our own in which there was life and creatures not unlike human beings. And they have developed and become sophisticated but they have absolutely no idea what God is like because he's given them no revelation of himself. And they become sophisticated enough to begin to explore the universe. And in the course of their exploration, they discover in a neighboring galaxy called the Milky Way, there is a sun out near the outer regions of the Milky Way with eight planets orbiting it. And the third planet in has such climatic conditions that are so right that life exists on that planet. And so they begin to investigate what is the nature of that life, and they discover our planet Earth and all that goes on here, and to their utter amazement, they discover there is a creature on this planet that was created in the image of God. Now, they have no idea what God is like because he's given them no revelation of himself, but they get so excited. We've always wanted to know what God is like. We've always speculated what is God like. Now, at last, if we could create the means of sending some astronauts to Earth, we could find out what God is like. And so they do. And the astronauts arrive. Let's say they arrived last week. They discreetly land their little spacecraft. Not sure where to go, but they follow a few folks into a bar because uh, folks seem to be going in there, and they kind of sit down. There's a big screen, and it's not playing sports in this particular bar. It's the world news. And they see what is happening in the Middle East. And they see the awful tragedy of so many lives lost at the hands of terrorists and caught up in the response children women bystanders and they see people killing each other and they're shocked the news moves on to Ukraine and they see what's happening there and then they hear about what's happening in Sudan and Haiti and Niger and Mali, the Central African Republic. And then they get statistics on crime in the locality, in the neighborhood where they are. And they hear about families breaking up and children not knowing who they really are, not knowing they're loved getting all kinds of trouble seeking for meaning and significance. They hear about the growing drug abuse in North America. And they turn to each other and they say to each other, is this what God is like? We need to go home. And so they go back to their spacecraft and return to their planet in a distant galaxy. And when they're on their way home, every camera on that planet is brought to their landing base and is focused on these men and women, these astronauts, when they step out of the aircraft, the spacecraft. And they notice... Their faces are very glum. 
And they say, you've been all the way to the Milky Way, to planet Earth, and you have... Did you, did you see human beings? Yes, we did. And tell us what God is like. Say, God is cruel. God is vindictive. God kills. God hates. God breaks things. Is that what God is like? Of course not. But that is the measure of our sin. Do you know what sin really is? Sin is the measure to which we fail to show the truth about God. And the measure I fail to show what God is like in his moral character, that is the measure of my sin. The definition, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The glory of God is another word for his moral character. Now you say, well, you picked all the worst things there. Well, of course I did, to make the point. But just supposing somebody came to you one day and said, would you tell me what God is like? And you say, you want to know what God is like? Yes, I do. Well, I'll tell you what to do. Come and spend two weeks with me. And just follow me around. Listen to the things I say. What's the way I act? Read my mind and find out what's going on inside me. And at the end of those two weeks, you'll know what God is like. Would anybody here say that? <laughs> what are you saying? You're saying I'm a sinner. I don't show what God is like. Because although created in his image, having lost the life of God, which is the source of that image, we have no capability of demonstrating anything other than what God is not. We fall short. Even in our kindness, because there's a legacy of God's image. Gentiles who don't know the law do by nature what the law requires. There's a legacy, there's an appetite, there's a sense of it deep down. Now remember, what we see around us are only symptoms. They're symptoms of a disease, of the cause, which is separation from God. When you go to visit your physician with some ailment, what we do is present to them the symptoms. This is what I'm experiencing. And the skill of the physician is, of course, to trace your symptoms back to a cause, identify the disease, and if possible, to heal it. Now, sometimes it, it isn't possible to heal the disease. Uh, maybe it's been difficult to identify uh, and make a proper diagnosis, or having made a diagnosis, it's, uh, it's not curable. And so what the physician will do will manage the symptoms and give medications and drugs and painkillers and recommend adjustments to lifestyle so you can live more easily with the disease which they're not able to address properly. That's the best we can do with our world, you see. I mean, we, we are grateful for people who look at the symptoms and try to resolve the problems. But the thing is, we get a problem that crops up here and we're grateful to our politicians and our leaders and other people who, who try to, to address those symptoms, but that's all they can do. All they can do is manage the symptoms. And they may bring this under control a little bit and make it a little more comfortable, but while they're doing that, something starts to bubble over here and this one pops up, so now we've got to give attention to that. And while they're trying to manage those symptoms, something else pops up over here. So you turn around and try and do that and this one comes back again because the cause has never been addressed, only the symptoms. And before long, it's all over the place and it's been that through history and it will continue to be that through history. There's no war to end all wars because the problem is the disease which is in my heart. I remember one day being in a high school 
And uh, I was asked to speak to a class of kids for about 40 minutes. I reduced those 40 minutes to about two. I said to those kids, do you like the world that you're growing up in? I mean, your parents and grandparents and previous generations have made this world. Do you like it? And the long and the short is that they said no. We don't like it. We don't like the fighting. We don't like all the stuff that's going on. I said, OK, tell me what's wrong with the world, and I'll write it down on a piece of chalk on the board. These are back in the old days when we had real chalk and real boards and things. <laughs> I can't remember the order, but somebody said, uh, what's wrong with people? What's wrong with the world? Uh, and, and they said, people are greedy, throw down greedy. What do you mean by that, by the way? And he said, well, people want what isn't theirs, and they're going to fight people to get it, OK? Some yes, some people are proud. What do you mean? Well, they think they're better than other people, so they, they squash them and sit on them. Okay, proud. Uh, people are selfish. What do you mean? Well, people are just all about me, 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 me. Okay, selfish. Uh, people are uh, greedy. Okay, well, they just want what isn't theirs, and they try to take it. Okay, and they gave me about 20 things. I said, okay, so what's wrong with the world is that people are are greedy, and they're proud, and they're selfish. They get jealous, you know. This is what's wrong with our world. Do you think that's what's wrong with the world? They said, yes. I said, supposing tonight you didn't go home from school. Supposing instead you got your school together, you locked the doors, you went into the main hall, and you said, listen, school, we've got a problem in our world. People are greedy, people are selfish, people are proud, people are jealous. Let's see if we can put the world right and stay here all night and see if we can put the world right. I said, do you think by tomorrow morning you discover there's some people in your school who are greedy? you think you find some who are proud? you think you find some who are selfish? you think you find some who are jealous? And they started to give me names. I said, don't give me any names. <laughs> but you just told me that's what's wrong with the world. Now you said that's what's wrong with the school. So supposing you didn't do that. You went home and got your family together, your parents, your siblings, your granny, and, and you said, listen, our world's in a mess. People are selfish, they're proud, they're jealous, they're greedy, and our school's in the same mess. There are people there who are proud and jealous. And greedy. Let's see if we, as a family, can work out how we can put the world right. And you stayed up all night. Do you think by the morning you might find somebody in your family is a little bit greedy, a little bit selfish? Somebody's a bit proud? One boy said, yes, granny. I said, leave granny out of this. <laughs> <laughs> Is this in your family? Yeah, I suppose, I said. OK, so don't do that. Supposing tonight you didn't go home. You climbed the tree. And you sat down and said, look, our world's in a mess. People are proud, people are selfish, people are greedy, people are jealous. And, and my school's in the same mess, and my family's in the same mess. How can I put right what's wrong? with the world. I said, do you think if you stayed there long enough, you'd realize that you're a little bit greedy sometimes, occasionally, once? <laughs> a little bit proud, a little bit jealous, teeny bit selfish. Do you think you'd find that? And they were quiet. I pointed to a boy who'd been quite vocal. I said, what about you? Everybody else said, yeah, him. I said, no, 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 shut up the rest of you. What about you? He said, I don't know. I said, think harder. Have you ever been selfish? I suppose. No, no, don't suppose. Have you ever been selfish? Yes. OK, now you're talking sense. Ever been proud? Yes. Greedy? Yes. What about you? So I said, so what's wrong with the world? You are. What's wrong with the world? I am. So how are you going to put the world right? You've got to do something about yourself. And this, of course, is the biblical diagnosis. That human beings, first, have become separated from God, meaning he's no longer indwelling us. And so inevitably, we don't know how to behave. So if that's the creative purpose, let me more quickly give you the redemptive purpose, which is the second thing. How do you put this right? What is the job description of Jesus Christ when he came into this world? Well, in John 10, verse 10, 
He said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. If the problem is spiritual death, there's only one answer to spiritual death, and that is spiritual life. And Jesus said, I've come that you would have life. And more than that, he said, I am the life. In 1 John 5, verse 12, this is a testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. Why? Because it is the Son who is the life. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life, because the life is the life of the Son. It is the life of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So Romans 8 verse 9 says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. That's what makes you a person reconciled to God. You become indwelt by the Spirit of Christ. Hence, Jesus in John chapter 3, meeting a Pharisee called Nicodemus, who was a teacher. He was way up on the spectrum there of Phariseeism. And he came to Jesus and said, how come you live the way you live and behave the way you behave? God must be with you. And Jesus' answer was to say, in effect, Nicodemus, that's exactly the way you can live this life too. And he said in verse 3 of John 3, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. That is to be the recipient of a new life. It is this new life that is going to equip you to be what you're supposed to be. And that is the nature of the gospel, of course. That we become alive, born again. There are different phrases using in Scripture. The gospel is not essentially about going somewhere. It's about being reconciled to God. There's a great verse in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 10, which says, Christ died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, and by the way, in the context, asleep there means to be dead. He's talking about those who are asleep in the Lord in the previous verse. So he's saying some people are asleep, that is, they're dead. So he says, he died for us, whether we're awake or asleep, that is, whether we're alive or dead, we may live together with him. That we live in relation with him, whether we're on earth or in heaven, whether we're physically alive or physically dead, that is beside the point. It's a relationship. It'll extend beyond physical life. But heaven basically is geography. It's not the prize. It's not the goal. It's the place to be. You've got to be somewhere. In this life, whether awake or asleep, whether we're awake, we live together with him. If we're not in this life, It's simply another geographical location. We're not saved to go to heaven. We're saved to be reconciled to God, to enjoy the presence and fellowship with God in our lives. As Derek said to us at the beginning, that we trust him, that we live in dependence and we trust him. You go through the teaching of Jesus and the gospels, the preaching of Jesus. He never told people to become disciples in order to go to heaven. Preaching in the book of Acts, there's 19 messages or parts of them. Never do they say, come to Christ to go to heaven. In all the epistles, never is that the reason to become a Christian. Become a Christian, be reconciled to God. Oh, and by the way, you go to heaven, but that's a consequence. It's not the point. The point is you're restored to that relationship where he lives in you. You're born again of the Spirit of God. And the consequence of that is that he then in you begins to express his moral character. And so in Galatians 5, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. This is not the fruit of the Christian trying his hardest. This is the fruit of the Spirit upon whom he is depending. He works in us. And it's a process that goes on through life. For Galatians 4 verse 19 speaks of my dear children for whom I'm again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. That's the goal. It's a process Christ increasingly formed in you. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 17, similar verse. 
Now the Lord is the Spirit, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Notice the tense there. Not have been or will be, but are being transformed into his likeness. Sounds like the Garden of Eden, doesn't it? Let's make man in our likeness. This is the process of the gospel. Until one day we'll be fully restored. 1 John 3, verse 2. When we get to heaven, what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And the restoration of the life of God in us, the image of God, leads to the restoration of the lordship of Christ over us. But we exercise dominion, that is, the lives we live have a mark because we're living under his lordship. And one last verse, and I'll give you an illustration, and then we're finished. Philippians 2, verse 12. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, the source of the divine image, to will and to act according to his good purpose, the source of divine activity then, divine authority. He works in us. Why? To give us new desires, new mind, new ability to live a new kind of life. Let me finish with a story. There was a young man in this church some years ago. He originated in a Middle Eastern country that was war-torn, and he escaped as a refugee, landed on the shores of Europe, got into one European country, and stayed there for several years. While he was there, he did a university course. And while he was there, he became associated with a corrupt lawyer who managed to produce false evidence that he was entitled to the citizenship of that particular country. And he got his citizenship. Immediately had his citizenship, he got his passport. And then he decided he would migrate to Canada. The opportunities were better here. On the basis of his European country's citizenship, he applied with his training and qualifications to come here, and he got a job, and he came to Toronto. Soon after arrival, somebody had befriended him and brought him to this church, and he became a Christian. Soon after becoming a Christian, his conscience immediately began to trouble him. I am here on false pretenses. I have a passport that was issued legitimately from this European country, but on the basis of false information. And he was deeply troubled. Nobody talked to him about it except the Spirit of God who is now living in him. He works in you to will and act according to God's good pleasure. Uh, uh Uh-oh, there's something here that needs attending to. One day, he got onto a plane at Pearson Airport and flew back to this particular country in Europe. I won't tell you which one. Flew back to its capital city. When he came into the immigration area, Entered the immigration booth, he passed his passport through. The officer took it, and this man said, uh, that passport was fraudulently obtained. I don't know what the man said to him, but he probably said, I beg your pardon? (laughs) His passport was fraudulently obtained. He ran it through his little electronic gadgets, and he said, well, it doesn't look like it. No, it won't. It'll look legitimate. But the grounds on which it was made legitimate were false. 
Well, why are you telling me this? Because my conscience is troubling me very deeply. And I want to surrender my passport. And I'm sure the immigration officer never had such an exciting day in his life ever before. <laughs> he said, I need to take you to meet a superior. So they left the booth. He took him up a few floors, took him into an office. He explained again what was going on. And this officer now dealing with him said, but why are you doing it? He said, to be honest, I became a Christian. So, well, now my conscience won't let me live with it. Did your conscience let you live with it before? Yes. Did you not feel it was wrong before? Well, I knew it was wrong, but it was very smart. Why is it wrong now? All I know is I became a Christian. And I'm troubled by it. I think they kept him for four days at the airport. Maybe in five. Went through various levels until on the last day, he was called into a superior office. Met a man who said, look, I, I've been told your story. We're trying to understand it. Your passport looks legit, but you're telling us it's on the grounds of falsehoods. OK, we accept you on that. We'll have to go back and investigate all of that. But he said, you're doing this because your conscience is telling you, yes. And my conscience began to trouble me when I became a Christian. He explained again all this. And this senior officer took the passport, slid it across the desk to him and said, uh, here's your passport. This country needs people like you. What we're going to do, right now, this passport appears to be totally legitimate. It'll get you anywhere. What we're going to do, we're going to go back through the background to it. We're going to identify what you're telling us is wrong. We're going to rectify it. We're going to make you a citizen. We're going to issue you with a new passport. We need people like you. And he got back on the plane and flew back to Toronto. And then he told us about it. Nobody jumped on his back and said, hey, you should get that right. No. You see, he'd been separated from God. So you're living by your wits now. You're living the best way you possibly can. Now he's been reconciled to God. And the Spirit of God coming to indwell him has worked in him to will and to act according to God's good purpose giving him new desires, new appetites. I, I need to do what is right. He did. I don't believe he's in the church now. He's moved elsewhere. But he was here for some years. And you see, there may be somebody here this morning and you've never receive the spirit of Jesus Christ into your life, never been born again. You might believe things about Christianity, that's possibly why you're here, but you've no experience of God, no coming and saying, God, I need you in my life. Come and live in me. Cleanse me of those things that keep you out. Forgive me and come to live within me. Maybe some of you have done that, and most of you have at some point in your life. But your fellowship with God is getting damaged. You're not living in harmony with him. You're not developing the fellowship and the relationship. And you're kind of drifting. And so then all kinds of other things will start to come into your life that are not healthy. And you'll accommodate them. You make room for them. You need to get back into a fresh daily relationship with him. We're never perfect in this life. We're not promised that. The old nature fights against the spirit, and the spirit against that old nature is an ongoing battle. We don't feel encouraged in ourselves because of that battle. But this is the gospel. That's why the gospel is the repair shop. Going back, what is the beginning intent? What was the creative intent? 
people looking at them will be reminded of God and his love and kindness and goodness and justice. And you'll exercise authority, you'll live with a divine, under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, with divine authority to live the way he wants you to live. And he'll make that true for you. We're going to finish now. After the service is over, as is custom here, there will be people who are available to come and pray with those who would like that. And if God has spoken to you this morning, and if you do not know Christ in this way, all the things that are jeopardizing your Christian life and your relationship with God, stay in your seat. And the procedure here is if you just stay in your seat, there are some folks around, part of the team here, who will come to you and say, would you like me to pray with you, talk with you? And let them come and help you. Just pray with you, that's all you need. Or if you want to talk about things, talk with them. And you'll be given that opportunity in just a few moments. But let's just pray together. Lord, we are grateful, deeply grateful this morning that you made us to function properly. And although there's a brokenness that will never be fully healed in this life, we know that we can receive the life of God, the energy, the empowering to live within us, to work in us, to begin to will according to your will and act according to your actions because that's your business in us as we respond to you in obedience and trust. And I pray for many of us that we will turn a corner where we've drifted away from you and come back into proper fellowship with you. Where we don't know you, bring us to know you today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.